What is up, everyone? Welcome to today's News Tonight, episode 69. <laughs> As always, nice. I'm joined by my good friends and GVG co-founders, Ash Paulson in the upper left, Derek Bittner in the upper right, me down on bottom, which has a weird, weird feeling to it today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But before this I get too to far into start. sexual innuendo... <laughs> Uh, this episode of Today's News Tonight is sponsored by our good friend and ardent supporter and fixer of my audio on occasion, Straightlace <laughs> and his game, The Soul Device. The Soul Device is a puzzle platformer where the player can create temporary platforms by shooting projectiles onto walls at the cost of HP to explore a Metroidvania-style environment. It's not a tremendously ambitious game, but Straight Lace put a lot of time into its design, and now, thanks to those who have supported the game, Straight Lace is happy to announce that starting April 9th, the game will become free for all to play. Ooh. To thank those who supported the game, those who bought the game prior to April 9th will receive the soundtrack as well. Unfortunately, Straight Lace has nothing further to offer those who bought both the game and soundtrack at this time, but it's thanks to the support of those individuals for helping cover the cost of development that Straight Lace can now make this change for everyone else. Straight Lace again wants to thank everyone for their support and looks forward to sharing the Soul Device with everyone. Thank you all That's so awesome. much uh, for Glad to hear showing be so support successful. to Straight Lace and for... Uh, so supporting this game it's the first game i installed on my gaming rig i still need to finish it but i i do enjoy what i've played i i love the fact that one of our patrons is also on the game development side of things it, it's so cool to be able yeah. to uh see him kind of progress with his skill set so um april 9th check out check out the game you've got literally no reason left not to so exactly. uh, and of course i did just post the link uh to both his youtube channel and the Saul device in our live audience chat and uh, there will also be links, of course, in the description below for you, the, those of you watching the VOD version. Nice. Yeah. So Very cool. with that, man. Uh, actually, got... you know what? I just oh. remembered. Sorry, Steve. I know we have a lot of news to get through, but I do really quickly want to show everybody a surprise really quickly. Oh, that's right. Man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So There's... my mask got the blue sample one? came in. I got the pink the one. The blue one. Yeah. And I love this thing. So we're one step closer to, to putting these into production. Just wanted to show everybody really quick. This is what the blue GVG mask looks like. And uh, other than the straps being kind of tight, like you said, Derek, yeah. I love this thing. It, I, I can see your ears getting pulled. I feel like we got to stretch it out a little bit in order to. Yeah. I put, I, so I have the black one. Uh, this comes in a mm -hmm. variety of colors, black, pink, green, blue. Um, I'm still wondering if we, if we should do a rainbow logo version where the logos are actually not desaturated, but this was easier to design in a quick, in, in a short right. amount of time. Um, but uh, we'll be making those available very soon since it sounds like yeah. Ash likes his. But I keep mine in my car, and I ran it through the wash, and it, it fixed kind of the tightness around the ears for me. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, um, nice. And possibly yeah. one with, like, just uh, one big logo in the middle could also work, potentially. That's what yeah. people might want <laughs> We're, we're going to launch with just uh, with just two designs in the shop to begin with. Uh, the, t the Good Vibes Gaming shirt that you've seen, uh, that also comes in a variety of colors. And the mask. I'm still waiting for my sample of that. Five or six. Yeah, we're waiting for Ash to get his test fit on the uh, shirt. But once, once we've got that done, everything should be a okay. Hopefully. Um, Indeed. Anyway, moving moving on to the news. We've got we've got a few things to discuss. Mainly, uh, the summer of this year. It seems so. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go ahead and throw our first story up on screen here, so we can talk about it. And that is that uh, the ESA has announced, and I, I don't know, the, the article says that they've U-turned on a proposal to put some content behind a paywall. Um, I don't necessarily think that that is accurate because the ESA themselves are saying, no, we're, we're, not, <laughs> we're not walling off any parts of digital E3 as it is. Um, this was reported on by Andy over at Video Games Chronicle. And uh, definitely seemed to upset the ESA because they just jumped right out there and debunked this as soon as he posted it. Um, which I kind of get. Uh, E3 is doesn't have oh, the that's, most sterling... I mean, that's the type of uh, news that will get spread like wildfire. Like, oh my god, really, ESA? They're right. doing this? So yeah. they needed to jump on it right away. Yeah, and kind of get that positive PR out there. And, and it may be that we can take them at their word and that every part of, of the E3 2021 online experience 
is going to be free for everybody. But this doesn't necessarily preclude them from later on announcing closer to the show, hey, certain content's going to be behind a paywall. We don't know for sure that they're not going to do that, I guess. I can't imagine them doing that. Yeah, I, I'm sure they need the funds, but who would pay for that? And who would want to be behind the paywall? The whole point is to get that information out there. Mm-hmm. It just seems like even if it was considered, it was a, just a dumb idea that maybe got a little farther than it should have, if it sure. was planned at all. But well, we also know that ESA makes a lot of dumb decisions, so... I was going <laughs> exactly. to say a paywall would kind of uh, make sense if they were trying to replicate the setup for the physical show, because... Uh, as you guys both well know, but most folks in our audience probably don't, uh, there are several different types of E3 badges, right? There's mm, right. Uh, there's your traditional industry badges, like the folks that actually work the show floor. They have like an, it, it's called an industry badge. Uh, what the three of us usually get is called a media badge, and that lets us in into the show, you know, and, and a little bit early. You know, it, the, the, yeah, the sometimes... benefits of that vary year to year, it feels like these days. Um, but the biggest thing is you get access to the media lounge, which has Wi-Fi and where Derek used to have to live. <laughs> and we would uh, and it would be where you'd retire to to report your stories. And they'd provide like some some basic like drinks like water, juice, tea um, and occasionally some food that was never very good. <laughs> if you, if you <laughs> like, can get there in time, at least. Yeah, yeah that too. It, media yeah. stuff. Like snap those up. Those those things did not last. <laughs> right. And right. then you have you, you have the gamer badge, I think is what they call it. Um, which is like it gets you access to the show floor basically, right? Um mm. but on top of that, and I didn't even know this existed until two years ago, they have the VIP badge, and that thing costs a thousand dollars. Jeez. Right. And it which basically gives you media level access, but for a price. And it, yeah. well, kind of sort of like it they end up uh you, you get access to the media or everything but the media lounge so you get in early during the vi during the media hours but they don't let you into the media lounge and the only reason i know that is a friend of mine bought that badge and i was like what is wrong with you why would you do that yeah that, that, that <laughs> seems like a dumb idea like yeah you get an extra hour which might help but there's still a lot of press there yeah the I thing mean, is yeah if you're going to e3 without appointments uh you're you're stuck in hell like you're in lines for everything even if you're in that mm-hmm. early hour because the folks i mean the folks working the show floor also really like video games so typically once the booth is set up they get in line to demo the stuff there they want to see and so by the time the media yeah. hits the floor there's already a line at most of the big name things like you know the year they had breath of the wild uh, mario mm-hmm. odyssey like all those big games have big lines even before oh, they let yeah. people in <laughs> so and oftentimes, at some of the smaller uh, publishers and developers, you know, the, the lines may be smaller, but they'll let media cut into the front of the line because that's, of course, you know, who needs the highest priority in terms of what they want, who they want to play their games. So, yeah, yeah you're essentially paying a thousand bucks to go to, I guess you could call it Q3, Q3, <laughs> E3, um, yeah. because it's, it's, it's line con is really what it is. And I get the allure of going to E3 if you've never been in terms of the exclusivity and the the pomp and circumstance of it all. And I, it, to be fair, I am talking as someone who's been to many E3s, but it's not worth a thousand bucks to wait. But in yeah, the isn't. exciting part of E3 theoretically is the, the conferences and these badges never got you into the conferences. Yep, uh, that's true. Yeah. So that's, I mean, that when, when I think E3, I think of the conferences and then, yeah, some demo opportunities there and there. But I think the, like, it feels like most people sort of kind of check out uh, check out from e3 for the main like discussion of e3 sort of plateaus once it actually starts and the, all the conferences are over because now right. there's no more announcements it's just okay we're seeing what is pl- how it plays now for these demos See, my my favorite part of e3 is interviewing people like sitting mm-hmm. down with the people that make the games i really enjoy and getting a chance to talk to them i think that is really cool but again you know, getting an E3 badge doesn't buy you that. <laughs> so, right. Um, well, and here's the other thing, too, is that, like, honestly, PAX West and PAX East have, have kind of evolved into shows that are that are essentially now public-facing E3s. Like, a, a lot of the same, like, I've seen year after year, a lot of the same games that will play first at E3, you'll get to play at PAX if you get to go later in the year. So, essentially, if you can wait a couple of months... Um, well, PAX East, I guess, is before E3 each year, but PAX West, at least, has kind of become kind of a mini E3. 
uh, in terms of playing what was originally announced at the show. Mm -hmm. The thing thing I find interesting is that I would really like uh, for a digital E3 to happen, but I think last year's was a mess. Like, I ended up not even really tuning into it. Same thing for Same. PAX. The PAX didn't. I don't even think there was. was I didn't even know there was a thing. I couldn't keep track of what the hell was supposed to be going on. It was. Yeah. Yeah, I was invited to it, and I I went, and it was just Zoom meetings, but nobody really had any idea where they were supposed to be, and uh, because it was kind of slapdash, like you didn't get your traditional emails from developers trying to set up specific meeting times. It was like, oh hey, pile into this room and we'll demo something, and I don't know. That's just not the way that I want to experience things like this. And it doesn't necessarily need to be in person, but I, I mean, Ubisoft last year did a great job of demoing games for me remotely. I played a lot of their upcoming lineup from this desk that I'm sitting at right now. And I wish more companies would do that, (laughs) but I also get that Mm -hmm. logistically people are just, they're still coming to grips with how they're going to demo products when people are stuck at home and, I, I don't know what the answer is, but I think that E3 going to a digital model makes sense for this year. But I truly, truly hope that we go back to physical shows in 2022 because stubborn, maybe it's just stubbornness, but it is a lot easier to process the information when you are in the <laughs> mindset of I'm here to work. That's all I'm doing. I'm singularly focused on meeting with people, learning yeah. about their games and producing coverage. And I feel like when you're at home, it's just falls into, yeah, I'm still here <laughs> doing my daily routine <laughs> yeah yeah i i don't know yeah. I, I i can't imagine how a digital e3 would even be like maybe the conferences still which would be you know kind of cool and exciting but i don't even think that's gonna be a thing because i feel like you know nintendo sony and microsoft would be like yeah we can just do this ourselves i mean yeah, no offense to them whatsoever like this is not a put down or anything like that but if wired productions can put that put on a pretty decent direction themselves and they're a pretty small publisher. I'm pretty sure not many publishers really need e- the, ES- the ESA for their digital event other than maybe the name recognition and maybe getting more eyes on it because of that. Um, so I guess that's the big question. Do- would the ESA think- allow them to get more eyes oh, on their product? Did we lose Derek? I think we did. I, I think he dropped out a little bit. Maybe he's just having some internet the issues. The ESA the hacked him. They just don't want him yeah. to. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they're listening. They're not, they're not happy with what we're saying. <laughs> hmm. uh, oh, there, you're oh, back, Derek. Are you back? There you go. Oh, I am back? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I don't know what happened. So uh, I'll I, mark that timestamp down. Totally fine. I, I think that what the big what the big takeaway here is that, you know, I think that they are trying as a stopgap to keep E3 relevant until it can until they can do an in-person show. And honestly, right. if I were in the ESA's shoes, I'd probably be like, hey, screw it. We're delaying E3 to December this year, <laughs> if they can. I know that that's, right. a, that's probably a bigger ask because you're relying on lots of publishers to have stuff to show. Um, mm. Yeah. You're also relying on the LACC's availability, essentially. You're kind of at the mercy too. of, yeah. But I don't know. I, I, I think that there's this is not going to be a big thing to report. I think we're going to see that E3 is diminished again this year. And people yeah, are I mean, really going to have a lot to say about this show. But there's a I'd lot of talk wrong. about the whole Summer Games Fest, and I couldn't tell you one thing that came out of the Summer Game Summer Games Fest. Yeah, yeah. Which, speaking of that, uh, Jenny G in the <laughs> chat just said Jeff Keighley would be so pissed if they delayed E3 to December, right? Because that would con- conflict right with the uh, Game Awards. Oh God. Um, yeah. So. It, it, it's definitely true that E3 needs the big publishers more than the big publishers need E3. And it'll be uh, interesting to see how E3 comes back and what capacity they, they come back next year. If they come, be- come back in force or if it's, it's a diminished in-person show. Uh, you know, it's been, of course, well documented on my end how I, I kind of still don't really like the ESA for the whole doxing thing. But... It's been, you know, longer since then, and I'm willing to willing to let them turn over a new leaf if they show that they're able to do so. So, mm-hmm. you know. Also, yeah, also apparently, right? according to Fangs, The Wolf, and Rob Barman X, uh, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2 and Crash 4 were part of the Summer Games Fest. We got that, at least. We got that. Okay. There you go. Yeah, but the problem <laughs> is, the format in which they presented the Summer Games Fest made it so hard to keep track of what the hell it even was. Yeah, I, I honestly thought yeah. it was just like Activision, like, okay, they're out, here's the reveal. Not really any part of any kind of show or something to that degree. I don't know. There's it just, just something about seem... it that's not as interesting, having these these 
events be online. And, and like you, Steve, I got invited to the PAX online thing for PAX West last year, and I bothered not even going or, or, or taking the invitation because I had heard from others that it was already just starting off as a shit show. And I was just like, well, it really was. What's the point? Yeah. Hmm. All right. So uh, well, we could we... talk a lot about E3 and its future or lack thereof. Uh, but let's talk about <laughs> something that we know is coming in the future, another digital event, if you will. And that is that Super Smash Brothers Ultimate is going to have a Monster Hunter Spirit event, which will add Magna Mallo, a Palico, and the Palamute. So, uh, you know, for those of you that don't speak Monster Hunter out there, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that is a giant dragon uh, and, your, and your partner characters, both the cat and dog that you can ride in the game. Uh, these were announced via the official... Uh, Japanese Smash Brothers Ultimate account or Smash Brothers Special, as and they call it over there. They right. might already be out because Mega Conrad says they already got them. Oh, they, they are out. Spirits. Well, the event started at 11 p.m. last night, I believe. So technically, still on April 1st for those of us in um, you know the Pacific Standard Time area. But uh, yeah, so it, it did start last night very late, and uh, I need to go in and get those because I want to keep my spirit collection at 100%. I am one of those crazy people who How does have I every spirit so do you have the oh do you have wait you used me and steve to get your contra and uh persona spirits oh 100 percent. oh i'm not saying i got them all 100 <laughs> percent uh i was gonna say there's like i don't think of, you yeah. have those so yeah you freaking and, and if i didn't have them i wouldn't have bought the games just for that of course i just would have waited till they they entered the usual the regular spirit right. rotation a couple of updates down the road oh man you could use my account i have monster hunter <laughs> get get your spirits. If oh, it was through do that, you get yeah. them also if you uh, just I, have oh, save sorry. data on? Don't think so, no. Oh, okay. Because I think this is just when you have to go into the game and, and actually earn them. Like, do the oh, spirit gotcha, battles. Gotcha, yeah. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, so these are easier to get. They, they last until the 7th, so you have you have some time. Yeah, exactly. I'm, but I, I always not. enjoy that. It, it's minor content, but I, I kind of enjoy going back in to, to experience new spirit battles every now and then. I kind of wish there were more, to be honest. Um, but, you know, when they do happen, they're fun. Boy, more spirit battles, more characters. You, you sound like an unsatisfied Smash fan. <laughs> oh, let me be very clear. I am. Is there not any other kind of Smash fan? I was going to say, <laughs> right? That, that means he's no, just no, a no. regular Smash fan. <laughs> I am fully satisfied. If they were to end the game today, I would be sad. I'd be sad, but I'd be satisfied. Satisfied. Jesse Jesse M in the chat says, "There's only one spirit I need, and I hope that it's Kitty Kong." Well, you already <laughs> got it. Kitty Kong's so already you, part of the yeah, good. evolved Dixie Kong spirit. Well, yeah. yeah. My point is, it would. The irony of of Kitty Kong facts not having Kitty Kong in Smash would be just <laughs> right. The one spirit de evolution in the whole game. It's like John is uh, John is somehow keeping him from getting it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Battle for the ages. Yeah. Oh my God! No way. Is is he for real? Oh, he doesn't need to get one hundred percent. Never mind. Okay, so he's yeah, clarifying yeah. he doesn't have them, but that's the one he wants, which is right. very on brand. But I thought you meant you had all the others. Oh, <laughs> right. That, that would the be irony of bizarre. that. Bizarre. <laughs> right. No, yeah. nobody can tame Kitty Kong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is that is uh, that is definitely fitting. I I understand now, but. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I love you, Jesse, but I secretly kind of want this to be like your white whale that you get every spirit somehow, but Kitty Kong just eludes you. <laughs> right. <of> life's, <laughs> life's work. Right. And Jesse also said, hey, now, don't be rude, Ash. I, I, you're right. I'm sorry, but I can't help but get my little Kitty Kong digs in where I can because I'm kind of known for that. So I have to. I think I it's more John known for that. Known for that. <laughs> it's on brand yeah. for you. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. All right. I, I don't know how to transition to this other than than having a big <laughs> I told you so, but I'm going to throw our next story up on screen. And uh, this comes from Cartridge Games on Twitter. <laughs> and it, the tweet says it all. In Japan, <laughs> Balan Wonder World debuted at just under 2,100 copies, completely missing the top 30 <laughs> in its first Oof. week at retail. Oh. Did anyone really expect this to sell well, though? Like, if, no, if anyone but did, I want to talk to those people because I'm curious as to their rationale. This for bad, that though. I yeah, just, I'm. Yeah, I think that the demo, honestly, and I said it before, I think the demo really, really hurt this. Oh game. yeah, that <laughs> demo was did. a bad I think a idea. A lot of people who might have otherwise bought it. 
yeah, I think a lot of people who might have otherwise purchased the game played the demo. And were, like me, I, I really would have bought this right. game. Right. And then I, I, was, the demo I, was, and I was intrigued. Like, this sucks. <laughs> yeah. I, I would have bought it too, and then and then you know essentially was like okay, well I'll still maybe play this, but I'm waiting until like it goes down to ten dollars. Fortunately for for all of you uh, watching, I uh, we Square Enix did come through with a review copy, so I will be reviewing it and uh, bringing you the details on how how, how, how is it so is. far, Ash? Does it live I mean, up to your Saturn era thing that you were hopeful this, for? This game more, <laughs> <laughs> right, right? Yeah, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to, in a weird way, I'm looking forward to, to the weirdness and the, and the jank. We'll, we'll see how it goes, but I know it's going to be a mess. Yeah, I feel I feel like Derek's internet today is powered by, <laughs> by Balan Wonderworld. By game. Balan, yeah. Ba- <laughs> Balan himself is powering Derek's internet today. He, I, I delivered these Discord packets for you, but I'm too busy dancing like a creep. <laughs> right. <laughs> just... <laughs> I just, like... I really can't re- believe that they, in good faith, released that demo thinking it was going to attract more people to the game or keep hype up, bring in new customers. I just, did they not play it before they released it? I just don't get it. How did that happen? I I, I do wonder. I have no idea. Like I said, I always smirk when I think about the fact that every bad game had a team of people behind it <laughs> and one person at the top who was like, ship it. <laughs> yeah it's it's ready to go it won't get better than this right and and like, you know to be fair like you know it, it's easy to dunk on on Balan and you know it's certainly a mess but we don't delight in in it being bad you know nobody sets out to make a bad game and there are you know presumably tens of people who you know maybe even over 100 who knows how big the dev team on this uh, game was but you know there are lots of people who put a lot of time of their lives into this game and, and nobody tries to go out and make a bad game. So as funny as this whole thing is, I do feel bad for the dev team, right? And and I mean the people under, the, you know, Naoto Oshima and, and Yuji Naka, you know, like I'm talking about the devs in the trenches. I feel bad for them. Well, I think that's the question, the big question it's... here. Does Yuji Naka have a career after this? <laughs> oh, man. Because who trusts him? He, I think Yuji Naka is going to be, I think Yuji Naka is going to be okay. I think that, Mm -hmm. I mean, you are right though. One does have to wonder how long do you coast on your mid nineties success, right? Right. Uh, Because he did produce, you know, some of the most memorable games of that era. Um, Hell, I mean, he made what is in my top, I'm going to be a little pessimistic and say five top five favorite <laughs> games of all time in fantasy star online. It's one of my favorite games ever made. Um, mm-hmm. The original fantasy star he programmed. And I think, I think what people forget is that Yuji Naka is an incredibly talented programmer who somehow became the face of a major franchise because mm-hmm. he didn't design mm-hmm. Sonic. He didn't, he, he programmed it. <laughs> and mm-hmm. that is a far cry from being, you know, Shigeru Miyamoto or Eiji Aonuma even or Hideo right. Kojima as loath as I am to to give that man credit for anything because he definitely it's, doesn't need it <laughs> it's kind of a different version of the situation surrounding Keiji Inafune right like he's he's more of a businessman than he is an actual developer yet he some you know he all he did become the face of the Mega Man franchise even though he's not the character's actual creator and so that kind of blew up in his face and a lot of fans faces when Mighty Number no. 9 happened so it's a bit similar to that story. It's just kind of from a different angle. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think I think it should be a lesson in uh, basking in the limelight and then letting that go to your head. Uh, because I think yeah. Naka, Naka could probably still do amazing stuff if he just stuck to what he is best at, um, which I think is letting someone else design a game and just being the technical person that, that pulls that together into something incredible. I think that when mm-hmm. he is tasked with directing, uh, he definitely doesn't do nearly as well. I think he needs mm-hmm. someone to kind of rein him in and give him a direction to work in. Um, Agreed. And hopefully Seems we see like that. It. Hopefully we see him paired with an incredibly talented director where his god-tier programming knowledge can can uh, help pull off something amazing. I mean, you know, I, I, I can't help but think of like, uh, you know, I would love to see him with hell Aonuma or Miyamoto telling him what to do 
<laughs> you know, I think that mm, yeah. he, he would be right at home at Nintendo as long as they didn't let him punch above his weight. And I right. think that Nintendo is one of the few places on earth that has talent of high enough of a caliber to be able to tell Yuji Naka, like, yeah, sit down. You know, the, uh-huh. the big boys are talking. We'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll handle this part. What the heck does he do at Square I at this be. point? Dude, I, but, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel oh, like Ball and oh, Wonderworld was, was a one shot kind of deal. And, and he'll be lucky if they let him helm another project or if he's yeah. even there long enough to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I really would be you know, speaking to that point, I, whether they let him do something like this again or not, I would be really curious to ultimately know how much uh, money Balan Wonderworld makes at retail, uh, you know, against its development costs. I really want to know how much this game costs to make, because, you know, one of the things you can say about it is that the full motion videos, as weird as they are, they're well produced. They're beautiful to look at, like the, the, the production values are way up there for those videos. So. You know, and, and, and FMVs aren't cheap to make and animate. So I, I just really would love to know how much this game costs to make. I, I Me too. I, I bet it's higher budget than most people think. Although I yeah, do want to so point out one thing because we were talking about where, where Yuji Naka's career goes. And I do have my dream scenario. <laughs> and that is that he just goes back to Sega <laughs> and <laughs> starts working on Sonic games. Like, could you imagine the hype if... Sonic oh, Team yeah. got put back together with Naka in it. I mean, that would be hell, I mean, right. after after Wonder put World, I don't know if it'd be hyped or not, maybe. or just like, oh god, poor Sonic just can't catch a break. Put him... <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, yeah, it, it would either be the best or the worst thing that ever happened to Sonic. But <laughs> I, I'll give him the yeah. benefit of the doubt. If it was a Mania style game, he really didn't miss with 2D Sonic. So mm. I would, right. I would be happy to have him and Christian Whitehead working together to make a Mania 2. Right. I, I just want cool. a Mania 2, though. If, if it was developed guess, by yeah, the Hamburglar, I'd still buy it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, it, Juan brings up a good point in the chat, asking, why does it cost $60? And, and I, I don't like to get too deep into discussions about, you know, a game's relative value, because value means so many different things to so many different people. But I do think that this the $60 price point for this game was a mistake. I think they could have at least eked out a few more sales at a $40 price point. I mean, hell, Sonic Forces was 40 bucks when it came out, I think. I mean, and that's heck, Sonic. Uh, so, Sonic and All-Stars Racing yeah, Transformed was $40 just, when, think, when it came especially out. Especially for an unproven IP and, and with such a bad demo, the $60 price point was just one, one of the many death knells for this game. Yeah, I agree. Any Anyway, we, we do have kind of a, well, uh, it's it's tangential at best. But before we move <laughs> to these new pieces, I have two pieces of breaking news for us today. Ooh. Okay. Ooh. Uh, first off, uh, Humble Jojo has edited their pledge from $1 to 5 bringing them into our live audience tier. So I don't know nice. if you're in the show today, Humble Jojo. That's just the name I have for you on Patreon. Uh, thank you so much for your generosity. We hope to see you here thank live you. for TNT whenever you can make it. And uh, secondly... Yes. We have uh, DJ Jersik joining the uh, producer tier, upping their pledge nice. from five dollars to ten. So uh, I don't know if you're in the audience either, DJ, but thank you so much for your contribution. You will see your name in the credits of tonight's episode. Uh, we appreciate Indeed. you so, so That's much. Awesome. Thank you both so much for your for your generous support, and we really, really, really appreciate you. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Heck yes! All right, absolutely. Mo- moving on. So this is kind of an interesting one. A scrapped proposal for the Topi- Tokyo Topio Tokyo Olympics <laughs> included an appearance from Mario, which, OK, that's, you know, Mario has has appeared in Olympic related materials in the past. Uh, but this was specifically 8 bit Mario. Uh, it says that uh, when to- Tokyo set to host the Olympics and there was a 300 page proposal and it was shown that uh, ultimately an 8-bit Mario was supposed to have closed out the uh, the Olympics, which that would have been an interesting thing to see. As we all know, the Tokyo Olympics didn't happen. <laughs> so I don't know yeah. what that means. It's a yeah, shame because there's like a yeah. lot of cool things that they seem to have planned for it. Apparently he was going to show up in his uh, swim trunks from uh, Odyssey just in his 8-bit form. And there's going to be some sort of synchronized swim number going on. Uh, I I don't know to close up the ceremony. It looked really interesting. It, it, it feels like a, a major shame that Tokyo didn't get to do these games because 
there's a lot of cool things they seem to be doing with it. Yeah, it, it's it's a shame. It seems like it would have been really fun, and uh, you know, to see eight bit swimsuit Mario somehow in sync with synchronized swimmers. I don't know really what that would have looked like, and I'm having a hard time imagining it. But I know I would have enjoyed it. Yeah, I I think that. So do we know, first off, before I continue, do we know if the Tokyo Olympics were rescheduled and they're going to happen at some... Because, I mean, the com- the I country know. had to invest millions upon millions of dollars to prepare for this. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm looking it up right now. I don't know if it's if they've been rescheduled or out and out canceled. I uh, don't... Right now... Oh, no, that's 2020. Uh, okay. On oh. Friday, Japan's Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga promised to deliver hope and courage to the world by hosting the Olympic Games despite fears of the event, scheduled to run from July 23rd to August 8th, 2021, may be oh, nice. canceled due to the coronavirus pandemic. So if that's if this is from AllJazeera.com. Apparently, according to the chat, uh, no overseas fans are allowed. It's only going to have a Japanese audience, which kind of kills the tourism, tourism that a lot of Olympics things bring. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's unfortunate, which I guess would make sense if they scaled back their plans for a grandiose kind of, you know, they're just, yeah. it's at a high school track. They're like, just run fast. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> this this is terrible, but instead of um, Swimsuit Mario, we're now getting Dr. Mario. <laughs> oh, God. It's awful. Awful. <laughs> it's terrible, Sorry. and you should feel oh, terrible. No, that was pretty funny. Um, yeah, I mean, and it makes sense that it's not open to overseas Attendees. I mean, it's a shame, especially given the multinational and international uh, nature of the Olympics. But at the yeah. same time, how do you sell that to Japan's population, right? Like, how do you sell, yeah, we're, we're still going to let people come and potentially bring different strains of coronavirus into the country. You can't sell that. Yeah. And nor, nor should they try. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's the right move for the people of Japan and, and for all the people visiting. I mean, because... You know, one one bad apple spoils the bunch, as they say. Um, mm-hmm. But man, yeah. it is uh, it is really unfortunate because I was I remember when this was announced and they had uh, didn't they have Mario in the announcement video for it? They they did. Yeah. Heck, there was already the Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games 2020 is already out. It's been out for how long? Yeah. I think two years now. So that's a weird moment in history. <laughs> Spoiler alert, Shadow the Hedgehog takes the gold. Um, <laughs> I already played story mode. I know how this ends. But, uh, There's that <laughs> damn fourth gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's a shame. I'm glad they're still doing it. I wish that I would be able to, even though I wouldn't. I'm, I'm just going to be real. Even though I wouldn't, I, I wish I could have the option to attend. I mean, but if I'm making one trip to Japan, it's to go to USJ. It's not to go to the Olympics. Well, I mean, that's the whole reason they wanted to get USJ ready to go because everybody here for the Olympics and, you know, definitely stop over at Universal. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I think Universal will be fine. I don't think the Olympics will be as cool as it could have been otherwise. But eh, what do you do? I'll watch it on TV. I'll see. I mean, hopefully they'll still have some kind of inclusion of Mario or or other stuff, you know, from the country because they seem like they were really going to lean into the fact that Japan has a rich culture that includes video games. And I Mm -hmm. really would have loved to see them fully embrace that. I'm hoping that this uh, proposal doesn't mean that they're just going, you know, as low budget as possible. And hopefully we'll still see some of that cool stuff. But all right, I can live without Mm -hmm. even Mario. I mean, if it means people staying happy, healthy, and safe, then go ahead. Get rid of them. It's fine. <laughs> he wasn't even going to wear a shirt anyway. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, as a few people in the chat are pointing out, let's all extend a warm welcome to the usual L.A. siren cameo that just happened on my end. Uh, they might be coming to fix Derek's internet. Who knows? But, uh, yeah. That's... You guys have all ran fine for me, so I don't know what's going on. Yeah, <laughs> weird. Really, yeah, you know it happens. Weird. I know mine... mine crapped out one of these recordings just randomly so it happens i've been i've been lucky during the day my internet has dropped like two or three times this week for about 20 30 minutes each even last night i was i was getting ready to go to bed so i didn't care but my phone suddenly popped up and it's like hey your wi-fi is not working it's like oh well <laughs> I'll, I'll deal with <laughs> uh, it tomorrow it'll fix it in the morning yeah so uh yeah i mean I'm, I'm lucky that it hasn't dropped out during tnt but yeah it's yeah. It happens. ISPs are terrible. We don't have many choices in America. What else is new? Indeed. Right. 
Speaking oh, well. of, I, I don't have a segue for this. Speaking of nothing, let's go ahead and <laughs> throw this next story up on screen because there's no way I could elegantly segue into this. And that story is that PlayStation Studios is kind of bringing a game to Xbox Game Pass. And if you guessed it was Major League Baseball, you were right. MLB <laughs> The Show 21 uh, is being published on Xbox. And while the headline would lead you to believe that Sony is publishing it, that's not true. Sony mm -hmm. is publishing the game on PlayStation platforms, which, again, makes a lot of sense. MLB, of or Major League Baseball, is publishing the game on every other platform. Again, makes a lot of sense. Uh, so the headline is really more Major League Baseball is bringing a game to, <laughs> to Xbox Game Pass, which when you read it that way isn't quite the revelation a lot of people think it is. Uh, but it is still cool that there is a game. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still developed by Sony. So Sony right. is, I mean, imagine for a moment, you know, Switch and uh, Xbox development kits in a Sony first party development studio office. Cause they're there. <laughs> right. And, that is weird I mean, to think about. It is weird to think that there are folks that signed up for jobs as PlayStation game testers who were then assigned to an Xbox game. I mean, that's, that's kind of not what most folks applying for that job expected. I imagine. <laughs> right. So, and I can't help but wonder like how involved Sony was in any of this. I, I can't help but wonder if they, tried to stop this from happening only because Sony, as we know, historically has been so closed to the idea of cross-platform play and embracing their competition as opposed to just competing with Microsoft and Nintendo, whereas Nintendo and Microsoft are obviously very open to working together. And Sony just so isn't. So I wonder if they tried and just failed to, to kind of stop this from being the situation. Just speculation. Can't help. Oh, it's hard to say the the interesting thing here the other interesting thing is this is the first time mlb the show has been available on any other platform ever it's always been sony exclusive oh yep. right it so. is about that it is a franchise that was created by sony but obviously mlb owns the license so i imagine i imagine that sony definitely pushed back on this that they were like hey look we'll give yeah. you an absurd amount of money to please not do this. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, but the problem, well, it's not a problem, but if you're from the perspective of major league baseball, you're like, yeah, can you afford to make up for all the sales we would get on competing platforms? <laughs> like, yeah, are you going to pay us right. that much? And it, it, I'm sure that it reached a point where Sony tried to moneyball the whole thing. And eventually they were like, we cannot afford <laughs> to, <laughs> to pay MLB what they want. And so MLB right. was like, I we I, I'm sure that it came down to you guys can make this game for other platforms or we can pull our business uh -huh. and someone else will pay us a whole hell of a lot more to make this same game on another platform. So you guys can be the exclusive rights holder or and make it on other platforms or we could just let someone else be that person. <laughs> Right. That's yeah. what I imagine happened as well. Yeah. Definitely. There's no way that Sony was just like, this seems like a great idea and we would love to lose this exclusive. I mean, yeah. I mean, baseball fans have been diehard PlayStation players for decades because of MLB the show. I know people who buy PlayStations for this franchise and now wow. they suddenly have a choice. They right. can say, oh, well, <laughs> I want to pick it up on the Switch, which I don't know why you would do that, but uh, I want to pick it up on the Switch so I can play you portable can play baseball. Go. Sure. <laughs> Fuck it. Well, <laughs> that's fine. And unfortunately, this also highlights in a bad way. Well, not unfortunately. Unfortunately for Sony, this highlights in a bad way for them the immense value that Xbox Game Pass holds next to PlayStation because you know, this, is, this game is still going to be 60 to 70 bucks on PlayStation platforms, whereas it's coming to Game Pass on day one on Xbox. So mm -hmm. it just kind of really, really puts that into a stark light. And uh, yeah, I can't imagine Sony's too happy about it. But like you said, Steve, I doubt they had a choice. Um, this, oh, good. Putting this on Game Pass. This is like the pettiest thing I think Microsoft has ever done. Right? <laughs> yeah, it They're really like, is. We're going to spend all the money to put this on Game Pass to send in a middle finger to the developer of the game. <laughs> It's like maximum petty. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jesse says now Microsoft can return the favor by making a new banjo game for all consoles. Don't we oh. all wish that? 
And Dan and Twistle very cleverly says Major Nelson League Baseball. I love that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah, goodness. I, I think this is a good move. I think it's nice that it makes you know, sense. I'm not, I'm not a baseball fan. I, I don't no. give two shits about baseball. I'm not going to buy <laughs> this game. I'm yeah. not going to play this game. I'm not going to mm-hmm. download it for free on Game Pass because it's just not something <laughs> I have any interest in. Yeah. But I, I love the fact because I've always thought that sports licensing in video games is terrible. I mean, telling fans of a specific sport because that's such a broad thing that, hey, you mm-hmm. have to play baseball on PlayStation. And you have zero options. And that, that always rubbed me the wrong way because it's not like Mario or Zelda or Halo or Horizon. Sony didn't invent right. baseball. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, yeah. but they somehow had the market cornered on it forever um, because, you know, baseball fans don't want to play as generic made up characters. They want to play as their favorite athletes, which I, I guess that's cool. I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't do anything for me. If you told me. I could play as made up characters or real people. I'd be like, I don't care. Give me whichever. <laughs> well, it's, right. It's right. fascinating to see this because it's so many of these franchises only have the one game every year now. And now I spent, because there used to be a lot more competition back in the day. And it was, even though I didn't play any of these games or uh, ever intend to, I still read the articles in the old gaming magazines where it was, yeah. where they had their sports guys, the people that were into these sports games specifically like with the NFL games where they would conf- they would compare Madden versus the 2K series and it was always just a like a one-upsmanship there they seemed to keep both titles really on their game and continue to just really push each other forward and then everything i've heard just through the grapevine since that point when it was just Madden at this uh, you know at, at, in some year uh, it seems like it's stagnated where they've barely like they've barely updated like it's roster updates and that's it. So, oh yeah, I mean people that competition talk about roster like a competition being, is a problem. You know, everything being a roster update and and some diehards will go back and defend that practice like oh hey you know they add X Y and Z you know it's like Smash Smash people talking about changes to the meta or whatever and yeah. um, I get it there are definitely subtle differences but it was revealed that at least on the Wii. For like several years, EA just pumped out roster updates. I remember there was literally zero changes to the code of the actual underlying game. They just subbed in new characters. Yeah, and I'm like, God (sighs) damn, that is ridiculous. But (laughs) yeah, I think that I think that it's cool for for baseball fans to have choice. As uh, somebody in the chat mentioned, I can't quite keep up with it. RBI baseball is on other consoles. Oh, it was Jared Edinger. Um, But I've heard RBI baseball is really terrible. I heard it's like I've not heard even that remotely as well. close to good. I mean, yeah. I think they should just cut the shit and start calling them just generic names like baseball 2021, football 2021. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one game. Um anyway, <laughs> I could I could go um, off about this, but it is good news at least. In response to our shared disinterest in baseball, our resident pun master Azran said in the chat, "This is episode 69. I think we can care a bit more about bases and balls." I just had to say that. It's really I mean, good. Third base. I, I don't want to go anywhere with balls anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I'll, I'll leave balls alone for this episode. <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's let's move on to some other decidedly good news. Uh, one, one that's more interesting to the three of us. And that is that we have some details on Final Fantasy XIV for the PlayStation 5. Uh, according to Nibel on Twitter, it will boast an improved frame rate, 4K resolution, faster loading times, which, surprise, uh, 3D right. audio, and haptic feedback, which I am excited for, even though I've never Hell played yeah, Final same. Fantasy fourteen. But most importantly, at least to Derek, the open beta will be available on April 13th with the release of patch 5.5, or at least that's holds true for Japan, which means that Derek may no longer be alone in Final Fantasy 14. Oh, no, uh, I got plenty of people to play with in 14. I'm just excited to get you guys in this thing because... And yeah. the thing is, I'm not I'm not going to be able to take advantage of the PlayStation 5 version. I have the PC version. Amy's the one that's, that plays off the PlayStation 4. And with this beta, she'll be able to take advantage of that and uh, see the updates. Like, I showed her a few videos from their producer video... Uh, producer presentation they had today. And... 
yeah, like it already had better load times on the PS5 compared to the Pro, but it's so lightning quick to teleport now uh, in the PS5 version. And I'm very curious where, where, where they're going to put that haptic feedback at. Like I can assume like when the, the crazy spell effects uh, and things like that. But uh, this is a for the, those who actually have gotten a chance to actually get a hold of a PS5. This is a good place to pop in. Uh, it yeah. plays very well. The only thing I'd recommend, if you have the ability, get a keyboard hooked up to the uh, PS <laughs> to your P- PlayStation, so you can talk to people if you so if you plan on that. You don't have to, right. but it does what? help if you want to do that sort of thing. Does, and that way, you don't does, have to use the in-game keyboard. Does fourteen not support like proximity-based voice chat? Not that I've heard of. Man, I've been aware of. Of. I assumed it did. That's kind of yeah, too bad. Because like I know you that I maybe... don't have to deal with a keyboard if I can help it, but you know, if I have Man, to, I have and to. And I don't know if either of y'all have been playing multiplayer games on the PS5. But goddamn, it is so nice to have the microphone built into the controller. I thought I would hate it. I really thought I would hate <laughs> it. But every Thursday, uh, my friend and I get together and we play games, usually on PS5. And it's like just having someone on speakerphone. Like it's it's so convenient oh, oh, to not cool. have to I wear a headset, that. not have to have a microphone, just be able to talk, and I don't have to like you know be close to the controller. I can just treat it like my phone's laying on my bed. Mm-hmm. Do you know if that works with like a group of people? That, like, say one of them has a PS5, the other has a PS4 Pro. Like, does that still work? Or it does. Like, it does. Okay, yeah, nice. absolutely. Yeah. So nice. I mean, That's for awesome. PS4 players, obviously, you know, they they have to be wearing the whole setup, but. Uh, you can you can, you can participate in cross console voice chat with just your controller. That's awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's really good. Real, real well, quick to answer a question from me, Juan: all these you know uh, features and additions and stuff mm-hmm. just makes me so happy that I waited for the PS5 version of FF14. Not to say that it wasn't great before the PS5 version. I've only heard amazing things about the game, but as a new player who is going to jump in soon i'm just glad that i get to experience all these ps5 <clears throat> benefits and i do hope that we can maybe square will extend extend us a couple of beta invites steve i hope they do we'll see i mean yeah. it's it's an open beta so you should be able to get in, into it and re- and real quick just for to answer juan's question even though I, th- I think the chat already answered it but just for anybody else who was curious about this you do not need a play at ps plus subscription <laughs> to do this <laughs> and then Erica, go love you, man. dead no one no one heard you Mm. Yeah, Juan's, Juan's yeah, question went, dead went there for a second. The you do not need a PS Plus subscription. Are you back? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I I heard it. Just just for those of you that didn't catch it, you do not need a PS Plus subscription to play Final Fantasy fourteen. But just the right. timing with which Derek's internet cut out was it was perfect. Perfect. I, yeah, I hear you guys just fine. I don't know what's <laughs> happening. So- you guys are not cutting out whatsoever. <laughs> That's so weird. That is really, really weird. Yeah. It, it's Ugh. bizarre. <laughs> anyway. With that. Anyway. I'm excited for you guys to, find, to check out this game. It, I will say it has it can feel a little slow at times, but the more you get into it, uh, the story does kind of catch on and build up and um, get interesting. So you gotta, kind of have to stick with it. But I think there's sure. enough around it that you can kind of get invested, especially you have some people to play with. And once you guys are doing dungeons and whatnot, I can join in and help you out and all that stuff. So it'll, it'll be all good time. I'm looking forward to it. And we can all certainly, you know, we can we can stream our shared experiences on the channel and, and that'll be a lot of fun, I think. Actually, yeah. speaking of, I, I posted a video on the channel, but just to have another little thing there, I will be uh, streaming Final Fantasy 14 tomorrow or I guess when this goes live for uh, on you know, for everybody else, uh, today, later today, uh, to celebrate, uh, Amy's birthday. She is a, uh, she's become a huge fan of 14 and, um, not really possible to do a birthday party <laughs> in this, uh, in town of environment. So with her being yeah. uh, such a big fan of 14 now, I'm ho- giving her, hosting her a birthday party in the game and that'll start at 6 PM Eastern. Uh, I am also very close to the end of, um, the main story of Realm Reborn. So basically 2.0. There's still 2.1 through 2.5 to get to before I get to the next expansion. But I do want to, um, but I, to end off the, I guess, main portion of the original game, I will be streaming that as well, which, uh, a lot of people are probably familiar with because uh, you need, there's a special event going on right now. We get special tomes that get unique or hard to find, um, mounts and minions and stuff like that. And to get, to earn enough, you have to, 
the best way to earn it is to run this dungeon that I'm going to be doing over and over again. <laughs> and he's been doing about mm-hmm. once a day, and it's, it takes about 45 minutes thanks to cutscenes, which are unskippable. Wow. Well, <laughs> well, they, unskippable, well, wow. The reason they chose not to skip them is, okay, they're not skippable, for, uh, but you know, obviously you're, you're a first-time player getting into this cutscene, and you want to experience the story. So mm. everybody else who's already played it skips the cutscene, and all of a sudden you get to the next one. They've already killed the boss. Right. Or Skip whatever it had ahead. Yeah, you, that makes sense. Have, they have to make it unskippable. I'm Otherwise, glad they did that in that context. Yeah. Yeah. Other cutscenes are definitely skippable yeah, in the game, I, but this I, this I one you have to. Sense, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited to jump into Final Fantasy fourteen to find out what it's all about and to Same. Uh, see how it looks and runs on PS5 because it's an older game. So I'm excited to see what type of enhancements they've This made. game was available on the PS3. Yeah, that's, that's what's... wild. That's wild. I mean, to be fair, yeah. though... I mean, Grand Theft Auto Five is the same. <laughs> it's coming out. I guess PS5 that's true. This year, I guess, and yeah. it started on the PS3 and Xbox 360. Who knows? What's God, going I didn't I guess think about that. That's true. That is wild. When a game is successful, man, it's successful. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. <laughs> these publishers yeah. aren't even hiding it anymore. They're like, yeah, just keep milking it. We'll figure something else out later. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I too am excited to jump in, and I'm really excited to, to finally hear all this m- incredible music I've heard from the mm-hmm. soundtrack in the context of the game. Like I, and I know some of the really, really cool remixes aren't until like the later expansions, I get that, but Wait. Th- even the base FF14 soundtrack, from what I've heard, is really good. Ash Paulson, well, are you saying that you have engaged in music spoilers? I For 14, I did, uh, for only few. because, I, I, well, for two reasons. One, they, some of them were theater rhythm DLC, uh, theater rhythm curtain call DLC, and there's no way I wasn't going to play that. And two, <laughs> most of what I've listened to are rearrangements of classic Final Fantasy themes, just because I'm so curious. Right. Um, I haven't listened to a lot of the original music in the game. And oh, okay. And for the base game, um, all the music's done by Uematsu, and Ooh, he gets one song right. per expansion. That's so, awesome. I love it. There is there is that. Uh. And yeah, the remixes are great. I was flipping out when I started hearing uh, Battle at the Big Bridge. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I bet. Nice. All right, folks. Well, with that, we have covered all of today's news. Episode 69 of TNT is in the bag. <laughs> Woo! Yay! This is normally where I yeah. tell our guests nice. to promote themselves, but uh, I think we're all from the same place, so it's fine. <laughs> I was hoping to try. I was hoping to try to get Amy for the guest for this one since it was her birthday, just... What? It's yeah, hard get, with a kid. Can we get a happy birthday to Amy in the chat? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, and, and a happy birthday from all of us to Amy, just so it's it's immortalized in the episode. Happy birthday, Amy. Yeah, indeed. Happy happy birthday to a, a foundational member of the GVG crew. Because without her, indeed. Derek would be a fucking mess. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would be. I, I, I Every so often I hear people like that haven't seen me in a while uh, see my see how I am now and like man how'd you lose all that weight tell me your secret Amy <laughs> just <laughs> right yep just Amy oh, all right <laughs> yeah. folks so before before we fully sign off you all know what's going to happen we have to give a thank you to our patrons at every tier uh, we appreciate all of you your generosity so much welcome to our new producer uh, welcome to our new live audience member we appreciate you guys upping your pledges supporting us in the way that you do none of this would be possible without y'all uh, but we do have to give a special thanks to our patrons at the producer tier for helping to make this show happen in addition a massive thank you to our patrons at the executive producer tier and above y'all are the linchpin that keeps us going sometimes <laughs> trust me and uh, I will <laughs> never true. be uh, too tired to read this list of names those fine folks are Jared Edinger, Brandon Bovia, Rob R Man X, Dan and Twistle, Z Patty, Hyrule Hermit, Sky Blue Flames, Adam O'Sullivan, Richard Herrera, Michael Phone, Floating Mew, Aiko Carroll, Christopher, The D Pad, Vesmio, Waffle King, Nick Waterman, Kitty Kong Fax, Angel Martinez. Vedron Hotik, Macalau, John, Joshua Hunter, Evernight Studio, Benny Yao, Shadow the Cat, Azran127, Kenrule09, Jake Pelka, Geller, Joseph Rutkin, Titus Malvolio, Charlie Bird, Lucky Wonderfish, 
Top Dog, 23100 or 23100. Young Ben Kenobi, Charles Zaz, Douglas Chomix, Andrew Medeiros, Oram M, Phantom 23, Patrick Harrison, Becca, Rocks the Cat, Fizzywig Hoyd, Flaming Highwayman, Sean Garrett, The Legend of Groose, Eddie B, <laughs> Kai Ed, Kit Fisto, West Egg, Master Links, Sean Davis, Deaneth, Jackson Jordan, Michael McCaw, Matthew Wong, Ashish Joshi, Goron Amber, Straight Lace, Hooby, Wolf X Blake and Moon Macarons, Kane, Captain Finlandia, 60 minutes and 60 seconds, The Game Orb, Dano the Artist, Synchro Lord, Brainchild, my mom. Hi, mom. Scuff196, Skull Kid Tiger, AJB Cool, Jason U. Loa, Jaden Buck, Phantom Project, Wheezy Penguin, and finally, Anthony Wilson Jr. Thank you so, so much. And remember that you too can become a patron over at patreon.com slash gbgaming, where you can watch today's news tonight live and get access to our exclusive post show for as little as $5 a month. Thank you all so much for watching. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to Good Vibes Gaming for more good times like these. And until next time, good night and good vibes. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Have a great weekend. Hell yeah.